All right. So you guys might need to hit the got it button for that. Um, Scott, man, it's all yours. Take it away, bud. All right. Well, again, thank you. And great to, to see everybody here. So always fun to, to talk to folks that are <clears throat> getting started on this journey really early. Um, yeah. So I guess starting the, the journey, if we're going to start the journey in high school, um, high school, I, was, I worked 70, 80 hour weeks. So I would have school, I'd have six or seven AP courses. I played three sports. I was on the football team, um, wrestling and lacrosse. Um, I was varsity in all three of those sports, I guess, in football and wrestling uh, as a sophomore, and then um, uh, all three in junior and, and senior year. And we were we had a good school. We had the you know state champions in football, state runner up in wrestling. We sucked in the cross, um, but you know so so these were we, we took these pretty seriously, and that was that was full, you know three four hours a day on top of schoolwork, and I just got really efficient about managing my time um, during the entirety of that uh, of high school. That was a big contrast to college, where I got into v- Vanderbilt was the best school I got into. I wanted to play a sport, um, but my parents kind of encouraged me, no, no, get into the best academic school that you can get into. Um, we'll cover the cost and go, go there. And I kind of think that was not such a great decision for me. I went to Vanderbilt was a good school, but I, you know, played on the club rugby team two days a week practice and games on the weekend. And I was in a fraternity. So I spent a large amount of time drinking beer and partying and having a good time, which was, which was great, but I wasn't really getting better during that period of time. And I had a lot, a lot of free time because it was, it was like this 80 hour week job with three sports to, you know, 20, 25 hours a week of, of full-time work. I should have gotten a job. I should have done um, some other stuff, but didn't really make the most of college. Um, again, had, had a good time. I, in my junior year, I got a internship at Dish Network and there was with 40 other students in that program. And we all moved out to Colorado, um, I guess for that, for that summer, 2012, um, made a lot of friends, got the job offer from dish network in the first week or two of my senior year and kind of had great, I'm ready to go. Um, I know all these people I'm going to move out there. I love Colorado. Colorado's got good rugby. So I can play in a men's league. Um, that was what I was thinking at the time. So in 2013, I started my job I had maybe three thousand dollars to my my name. I had this background of high achievement in, in high school, but didn't really maximize that potential in college. And I'm ready to hit the ground running with my with, with work. And I rapidly find out that there's just no ability to flex my mental muscles or my hustle muscles at work. There's no there's no opportunity. There's no reward for taking on more. And I discover in the first couple of months this concept of financial independence. I discover it through two sources. One was uh, Mr. Money Mustache, uh, a blog that kind of talks about financial freedom through badassity. So it's about how how frugal can you get? How do you save as you know a, as much of a percentage of your income as you possibly can? Put it all into the stock market and coast to financial independence. So I really bought into that. I, th- I thought I really loved this idea of being able to retire or be financially independent in my late 20s, early 30s. Um, but I wanted to get there even faster. And so I also coupled that research with this concept of real estate investing through a site called Bigger Pockets. Um, so I was a fan of both Bigger Pockets and Mr. Money Mustache in my first year as a financial analyst before I, you know, the, the, the next parts of my journey begin. And I, this plan emerges where I'm going to save 20 grand this next year, and I'm going to use it to buy a duplex. I'm going to house hack. I'm going to live in one side and rent out the other. So over the course of 2013, late 2013 into 2014, I, I do that. I save. I drive for Uber. I read a bunch of books. I try to start two businesses that fail. One was winter gloves for driving. One was winter tire rentals. Um, neither of those really gained much traction. Um, but I'm, I'm able to save up that 20 grand by about July of 2014. And in that period, May, Ju- May June, July 2014, I joined a mastermind group with local real estate investors. And by taking out those real estate investors to lunch one by one, I meet the founder of Bigger Pockets, a guy named Josh Dorkin. Um, and I tell him how I'm a huge fan of his site, how I'm doing everything he said. I'm actually right here, right, you know, that day. Right now, I'm meeting a investor in a group, just like you told me to, and taking him out to lunch to get to know their story because I want to get into this thing. Um, he tells me to go away a few times. And a few weeks later, I interview for a job with Josh Dorkin, and I interview for a second job um, as a real estate agent. 
So I like to think that um, that was that was a big pivotal moment for me is choosing between those jobs. It wasn't that close. I I bigger pockets was offering me less salary and less upside, but I just knew something was special about bigger pockets. I was a big fan of it, and I could see the power it was having on people's lives. Um, but I like to think that if I taken the agent job, that would have worked out pretty well too. There's a couple of guys that, but there's a guy that I know that was in that same group who took the agent job and did very well over the next four, five, six, seven, eight years um, with that. Um, so, anyways, I joined Bigger Pockets in 2012, and then in in July of 2012, and in November, I closed on my first duplex, which is a $240,000 property in Northeast Denver. Each side rented for about 1,100. Mortgage was 1,550. Had a roommate in my side, um, so I think we got 1,700 in rent and. 1550 in mortgage, not living for free, but pretty close. Um, and that was really like that 2014 really set the foundation for all of the next growth in my career. I started, I started, you know, my career with 3000 bucks to my name and no debt, very fortunately, and ended 2014 with a job at the startup that was fast growing in that first duplex. Um, and over the next six, seven years, I took on more and more responsibility at Bigger Pockets. Just kind of stuck my hand up um, for any and all opportunities or, or challenges that the company had. I wrote for the blog, and I began to get my my name out there a little bit in terms of what I was doing and how I was trying to build wealth. And be, kind of rose up the ranks of director, vice president, president of Bigger Pockets. And in 2017. The founder Josh Dorkin stepped away from the business and uh, to, to to do to for, for a variety of personal reasons and asked and named me president and said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna go through a process here and bring in some new investors." And so in 2018, we transacted the company with um, a private equity group called McCarthy Capital, and that was the next kind of big, I think, career milestone for me. Is is uh, really, you know selling this company for tens of millions of dollars and uh, bringing on some some serious investors on this. Um, and then in the last four years, I've been continuing to kind of just grow bigger pockets and grow my portfolio. So each and every year I buy another property, each and every month I sweep, you know, whatever excess cash I have and put it into index funds. I'm an investor in bigger pockets and I've now built up a portfolio of, you know, 10 to 12 units, I guess 10 units here in Denver. Um, we're about to offer on another two. Um, this week, um, I guess today. Um, and then uh, uh, I have a stock portfolio. And then, yeah, like I said, own bigger pockets. So, how, how'd I do there? That was seven, seven or eight minutes? Yeah, I think, you, uh, I think you were under the gun. So, good job. Um, I have to comment on the, the comment you said, because I know that you love cheesy jokes as much as I do. You said the, the winter tire business didn't work out, it just didn't gain any traction. I, I had to be. That's right. Yeah. I had to be. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm going to switch my view back to everybody here. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we have another um, 50 minutes with Scott. This is, uh, this is prime real estate time to, to ask an expert questions and get his ideas, uh, thoughts, and his wisdom. So we're going we're gonna to do this a, a different way than what we normally have. I'm going to go back and forth. If you have a question... Um, digitally raise your hand. Uh, if you're on a laptop, you just hover over the bottom on your phone. There's a way to do it. If you can't figure that out and you want to ask a question, you can put your question in the chat and we'll kind of go there every, every third question or so. And if there's a question in the chat, we'll read that one. Um, so I'm starting, I'm trying to see if there's any virtual hands up. I don't think I see any. <coughs> oh, now I do. So when I, when I call your name, you can just uh, ask your question. Remember to put your virtual hand down and Scott will answer it to the best of his ability. And let's start with Aiden, Aiden H. Good to see you, by the way, bud. Hi, uh, it's good to see you too. Um, but uh, my only question is, uh, I actually don't really know a lot about index funds. I was wondering if you could potentially like describe them a little bit more to me. I, I, sorry, I don't really know a lot about them. Yeah. So I, I, when I started investing, it was probably like junior year of college with a few thousand dollars. Right. Um, and what I did is I, I got really into this idea of investment analysis, where I'd pick stocks. Um, and I, and I use this example all the time, but I picked a Chinese fruit juice company because, 
you know, their market cap was a hundred million dollars and they had 120 million in cash and no debt. So how could they possibly be worth less than hundred, hundred million bucks or 120 million? Um, that was a no brainer. Well, I didn't realize that Chinese companies lie about their financials. Um, and everybody else in the market knows that except for me. Um, and so I, I ended up losing money on this sure thing. And I tried this for multiple times going, going forward um, because I was a big believer in, in, in um, hey, I, 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 was, I was at least interested in the concept of picking stocks like Warren Buffett. Um, and after I did more research and had a couple of losers, I kind of shifted my perspective. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to pick stocks and try to hit winners. I want to get an average return and keep it boring. So what, I'll, what I do now is I buy index funds, and Dan, now this is the answer to your question. An index fund is essentially, uh, it buys all of the companies in a given index, right? So mine is the mine is um, one called the uh, Vanguard, um, and I, it's called VOO is the ticker symbol, but it, it buys all of the large cap stocks in the S&P 500. Um, mm-hmm. And it, so I get, the, I match the return of the S&P 500 over a long period of time, and I own a little bit of a little piece of each company. It's weighted average, so I own more of Google than I do of some, you know, some rinky-dink company at the bottom of that list. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yep. No, no, no. Get rich quick there, but you know, you will get yeah. the average return over a long period of time, and I think it'll be you know eight to ten percent over the next thirty years, and um, you know, average is average is good. Um, it requires no effort. Thank you. And I'll just add to that. I think some of you probably know this already, but in the early financial independence community, that there's two main ways to invest that really jump out. And one is index funds and the other is real estate investing. And, and some will do heavy on one and light on the other, or some will go kind of 50-50. Some will go all in on real estate and zero index funds or vice versa. And there is no right or wrong. Um, but those are the two tried and true and, and trusted ways to build wealth over time, uh, real estate and index funds. Let's go to Daniel. Hey, Scott. Hello. Um, question on systems and processes as it comes to bigger pockets and leadership. So I feel like I've probably listened to every single episode of Bigger Pockets ever uh, on all of the the platforms. So I feel like I kind of know Bigger Pockets story and all that kind of stuff. And I know whenever you took leadership, like 2017, 2018, I know you've talked about having to, um, I don't know, fire is the right word, but maybe like realign um, employees and just like structure to make sure y'all are accomplishing goals uh, to move the company forward for investors and everything else. But if you could just talk about that process and what that was like, and just like the tough decisions you had to make and like how you made those in order to grow the company. I'm very fascinated uh, on that. Yeah. I, 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 I think, yeah, the, the word realign is probably the right word um, to describe that process. And there are actually, there's actually now been two phases now where I think we've had to go through that as a, as a business at bigger pockets. So the first, as you mentioned was in 2018. So in late 2017, like November, December, um, Josh steps aside and is not coming into work anymore. And in February, I become president. So for three months, we're, you know, we're leaderless without Josh. And, you know, I'm sort of acting in that president role, but I'm not officially the president at that point. So I don't have the the power to actually make changes um, to, you know, certain personnel. Um, So in February of 2018, when I become president, I'm thinking, okay, we're going to bring in private equity investors. And I'm the president of the company. And I don't know what the heck these 12 people do to add value. I know what they do, but I don't know why that the company needs those roles in there. And so my, my thought was, well, if those folks, if I don't know what they're doing, some private equity investor is definitely not going to know what they're doing and they're all going to lose their jobs. So I was like, I, and I need all the help I can get to, to move the business forward and put it in, in a position to be successful over the course of this year. So I went in and I said, I don't know what you do, but you're now on this task. You're now on this task. You're now on that task. You're now on that task. I think a more seasoned CEO would have said, no, no, here's the structure we're going to put in place. And I'm going to remove these positions and bring in new team members to, to meet the, the, uh, to, to do these new jobs. But at the time that was not my orientation. And 
I thought I, I thought it'd be much more productive to try to save jobs and 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 keep keep these folks on board. Um, half of those people did not like what I was asking them to do as the you know what, what I was um, enforcing and saying you are now doing, and they left the business. And the other half um, went on and embraced the new roles, and I think thrived in the, in that. And over the course of the year, that that proved to be very successful. That realignment, we began to immediately see um, lots of parts of our business um, getting paid the attention that they needed, um, and and beginning to grow. Fast forward two years to 2020. Um, and we're running into another problem, another set of problems that are very similar um, in some ways. We, again, my, my management philosophy up till that point in time was this is a team where everyone's on the same page or everyone's on the same side here. I'm going to grow the business and make sure that nobody is left behind. And what that meant was in many cases, when someone was not performing, I would promote them and give them two people to manage and put them on something else where they couldn't do any harm. And then I'd bring somebody in who could do that next piece. And this cascaded into a very weird looking org chart that didn't make a lot of sense with some people that I think were, you know, I think maybe in some cases we had done, um, we, we had over promoted or, you know, um, get put people in positions where they weren't able to be successful. And so I just completely started over with a blank sheet of paper. And I said, how does this business work? How should I, how should I structure it for, at the leadership team level to make this a healthy environment that can be successful for our users, you guys, over a very long period of time. And so I said, okay, that the structure there is we have four business lines. We have a media business with our podcast and YouTube channel. We have a book publishing business where we sell books. We have a subscription business with our pro membership. And we have a market marketplace business where we connect our users with agents and lenders, property managers, so on and so forth. Each one of those businesses is going to have a general manager that manages that business line. And then we also have supporting functions of finance, technology, HR, and marketing, right? And so we have a leader in each one of those spots, and then we're going we're to structure the business around that and realign the business around that. And so I brought in almost an entirely, an entirely new leadership team in late 2020 and early 2021, and that has completely transformed the business and the way we operate um, to, have, to have those folks in. And we've kind of seen the, the next you know, huge surge in growth. And I think we're producing better content in a lot of ways than ever um, across most of our channels. So how's that to answer your question? Yeah, no, awesome. That's, that's really cool. And really inspiring too, as, as we grow uh, in real estate, whatever, and building out teams and how you put that together. Um, so thanks, Scott. Yeah. The, the big learning curve is if you can start with the right structure in place, then, then you're going to be way better off. However, it might take you three years to actually figure out what the right structure is. So that, I, I don't know if I, if I could have started with that right structure, I would have, you know, three, four years ago, but I don't, I don't think I could have put it together until I had more experience. Yeah. I think I'll add a little bit too. I, almost everybody on this call is familiar with bigger pockets or, or if not intimately familiar with bigger pockets as um, a member and listening to the podcast and the YouTubes and the social media. And I think, Every time I hear Scott talk about bigger pockets, it's always fun to get that inside glimpse into a company that I know and love and what's kind of going on on the inside. Um, how many employees now, Scott? We have about 60 employees. Six zero? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, let's go to Ben. Ben Carver, good to see you, man. What's your question? Hey, I feel like hey Scott. Hello. Thanks for being here. Yeah, happy to be here. It's, this is great. Absolutely. I, I love your book. Um, I share it with all my friends, made my wife read it. So good stuff. Um, so I, I was just wondering what general advice you'd have for someone who's looking to start house hacking in the Denver, Colorado area. Um, I'm actually living in Texas, but uh, I'm really passionate about Colorado, looking about uh, moving up there in about a year when I, uh, when I graduate college. And uh, it's obviously a lot more expensive up there than you know, it was 10 years ago and obviously the housing market is crazy. I don't know if you have any general advice for that, but. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, zooming way out, renting is more expensive than house hacking and buying a home is more expensive than house hacking. So regardless of how difficult and expensive housing is becoming, house hacking is, is always going to be your cheapest and perhaps lowest risk option if you buy the fact that low risk is in is the you know 
over the next five to 10 years, rents are more likely to go up than down and prices are more likely to go up than down over a five, 10 year period as well. Um, that gives you your kind of, to me, that that's always a lower risk option um, than being on the other side of the equation there. That said, you're getting a huge mortgage and all that kind of stuff. But this same fear was, it was or I had this exact same fear in 2014 when I bought the duplex for $240,000. We'd been going up for five, six, seven years. Prices were at all-time highs or you know, you know, approaching them. And it was it was a crazy market at that point. Obviously, it's now, what, eight years later? And that has been true every year um, from a scary standpoint. I think that, so so from at the, at the highest level, the broad advice is, I think it's the right strategy. I don't think there's another reasonable path you can take in the first couple of years to be to have a chance to build wealth and to subsidize or or cut the housing expense which is the largest expense in your life. So I think it's still something to look into. Second, to answer your question more specifically, in Denver, I don't think the buy a duplex, live in half and rent the other half works as well as it did what, you know, 8 years ago when I was getting started. So I think that people are be, are getting more creative here. And there are two primary tactics that I think are the ones that are getting the best ROI right now. One is rent by the room. So if you can buy a three, four, five bedroom house and rent out each room, you're going to get more cash flow and you're going to be able to manage that more easily in the first couple of years. Obvious trade off is you're going to have three, four roommates um, if you're going to do that. And the second one is Airbnb. In Denver proper, Airbnb is you, you're not allowed to Airbnb your property unless you are the owner occupant. Which means that if you are the owner, if you're one of the people who is willing to owner occupy an Airbnb at your place, you have a huge competitive advantage because you don't have that much competition from investors that are doing it professionally. So you can get a tremendous amount more ROI. One specific tactic that seems to be the a hot one right now, or the best that I've heard recently, was you buy a house in Denver with an ADU, live in the ADU, rent out the nice the the, the main part of the house, and when you're done, you convert it into a medium term rental, which is 30 days or longer, um, because it's already fully furnished from the short term rental that you were doing while you live in it. So that that's a that's the way I would get your that's the first thought I would put into your head. As you do more research, perhaps other options will come to light. Thank you very much. I that that last one was really creative. I like that. Yeah. So that that I can't take credit for that. Somebody else. Um, uh, 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 talked about that recently and I'm just regurgitating it, but that'd be where I'd start. Thanks. Um, medium term rentals are becoming a thing now. Uh, short term rentals are very high maintenance when you have someone staying two or three nights, they can be very profitable, but they, they are a lot of work. Um, and long term rentals just don't create as much cash flow. This medium term rental thing is an, is a new trend that I think is catching a lot of steam, 30 to 60 days, something like that, maybe yeah. maybe three months. And everyone talks about traveling nurses, but I think there's a longer term trend backing medium term rentals, which is just that people are now able to work remote more easily. And so why wouldn't you want to go and spend 30, 60 days in a cool city somewhere else while you're renting out your place? So I wonder if there's some longer term trends back in that as well. But the real reason that most people talk about medium-term rentals is because most, a lot of cities define short-term rental as less than 30 days. So great, I'm going to rent it out for 30 days, which is the minimum possible amount and try to get more rent than I would with a, a long-term lease. And I, I, I hope I'm not spilling the beans here, Scott, but I think that bigger pockets will soon have a book about medium-term rentals. Yes. I think that's coming out later this year or early next year. Yep. So something to keep an eye out for, guys. Uh, let's go to Marcel. Hey, hey, Scott, how you doing? Hello. Um, so I wanted to ask, if you were to start over with all the knowledge that you have now, what would you do differently? If I was to start over with all the knowledge I have now, I think I would repeat a lot of the things. So, so I, I kind of glossed over this when I was talking earlier, but I was very intense for those first three, four, five years um, in building this wealth. Like my, my daily routine would be, you know, there'd be a workout in there, but there would be, I wake up, eat a healthy breakfast, bike to work while listening to something 
that was reasonably productive audio, um, work for eight, nine, 10 hours, then stop working, go and write and produce content for the, the Bigger Pockets blog um, during that period. Or in the before that, when I was at Dish Network, I would uh, Uber or tutor. And I just tried all these side hustles one by one by one to see what would stick there. So that I think all out intensity is what I would keep um, if I were to do it again. I think that that's, you know, it sounds like a ton and it is, but the advantage of it is you build a lifetime of wealth by the time you're 30 um, and get to reap those advantages for the rest of your life. So I, I would keep that. Um, I would keep the goal setting. I was a very religious goal setter, still am, um, with the you know lifetime or vision for three to five years, annual, quarterly, weekly, daily um, goal setting. That cadence, I think, would uh, is something I'd keep. And I keep the networking and the self-education. What I'd change are the tactics um, to a large degree. Right now, I think that, um, like I mentioned, I already mentioned the new tactics with the house hacking. I think there's a lot of new information there where you can get you know that much better returns. And I think that I would I would concentrate my search on what I perceive to be the biggest asset class opportunity right now, which is I think that baby boomers. This is very specific, so you're going to get a very specific what out there answer. But I think baby boomers are retiring at huge rates right now. And tons of them have businesses, small businesses that are poorly run, mismanaged, you know, have, you know, have been in operation for 20, 25, 30 years um, and can be improved. Uh, And a great example of this might be like a janitorial business, right? Like my janitor, great guy, but like they, they don't have any systems. They're, they're like, there's a fa- there's, they're sending me a fax, uh, you know, which, which I have to use some technology to, to, to receive there. I think that there's a ton of like incentive, like I'm, I got like all this like incentive stuff. Like they're like, we, we pay our guys hourly, but then they go really slow. We pay them by the job. Then they do a really fast job and it's terrible and they're in and out. And so how do you, how do you solve it? I think there's a creative entrepreneurial opportunity to solve problems in these small businesses for go-getter young folks that are able to save up the cash to buy them um, because these guys have no one to sell them to. The other attractive thing is the price in these businesses. People are selling these businesses for one times cash flow. So that'd be like you're buying a rental property that produces 100% cash, like you know a $400,000 rental property that produces $400,000 in cash per year, right? Um, so I think that a creative um, person could spend a year or two in prep and figure out which opportunities in these usually services-based businesses that boomers are selling. And you think that if you could aggregate a couple of those businesses, you know, buy one, manage it for a year or two, buy one, two, three more. Now you've got a business that's not generating $100,000 in cash flow, but maybe generating 800,000 or a million. Now you could sell that business for three, four, five, six times cash flow. Um, and you're getting that really nice multiple arbitrage. So that would be where I would be looking right now if I was starting over. I like to joke that if, if I ever get fired, I hope I don't get, won't get fired. I don't think I'll get fired. They were doing really well. But that would be, I would you know take six months, play a lot of video games, try out that Elden Ring uh, I think that just came out. And uh, then I would go in uh, and try to aggregate a couple of those businesses. How's that? Good oh. stuff. Was awesome. To to kind of add to that question, sorry about that. Um, how would you go about that though? How would I go about that? Yeah. Well, well, so I think it's the same thing as um house as so first of all, you could buy these business. So let's let's say that you have a business that is generating a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in cash flow, right? Um that and and let's say let's say it sells for two fifty. Right, because you're not you're not in the one times. You're, you're probably more in that like one to you know two times. So how do you how do you buy a business for two hundred fifty thousand dollars? Well, if you have it, this is where you know seller financing and small business loans come in, right? So you could buy this business with fifty, sixty, seventy five thousand dollars, right? That's not nothing. That's a few years of saving, and you will need business experience of some sort to be able to pull that off. But it's it's not out of reach entirely for a lot of folks. So I think, and and sometimes these businesses also come with real estate, which you can also leverage against separately or as as part of that same deal. So I would would think about getting to that 50 to $100,000 range, having some kind of generalized business experience 
and then being able and then figuring out how to how to transact on that business from there using a combination of seller financing, cash down, and then small business loan. And Scott, there's a there's a website I think I don't I don't know how awesome it is, but that has small businesses for sale. Do you know what that is? I think it's called Buy Biz Sell. They make it hard. Um, and they have it's like a listings thing there. But yeah, you can you can browse those. Um, and then, you know, contacting a couple of local business brokers, this is not like, a, Hey, I have this idea and I'm going to go buy one in the next three months. Right. Especially not if you're, um, early in your career, but this is definitely something within a year or two that a go-getter could figure out how to, how to get into to some degree. And you can go on buy biz sell, look at some of those to see if, see if I'm crazy or not. Um, and go look at some of those businesses. They have them across all these different types of services, um, uh, and uh, websites and all that kind of stuff. But by business, I will have those. And then what you also want to look at is the business brokers in there. And some of them may not give you the time of day if you're two years away from buying a business, but some might. And so if you could talk to a couple of business brokers, um, these would be folks that might be able to, to help kind of guide, guide your path to some degree. Perfect. All right, let's go on to uh, Adrian. What's your question? Uh, hey, Scott. So uh, with your knowledge of real estate and business, a uh, little background knowledge, I run a small lawn care and landscaping company and then Christmas lights installation company. Um, I will buy a property this year, either a multifamily or a single family. Um, if I'd go multifamily, it would be with a partner and it would be between 400 to 500 K um, simply just because I still want to have cash to grow the business because I still want to grow the business but I also want to get into real estate. And so multifamily with a partner or single family down the road, it's uh, like two, three houses over and it has a big metal building there. Um, so I would use the metal building to run the lawn care company and the Christmas lights out of, and then I would use a single family house to house hack uh, as well as, you know, use it as storage and all the everything that I would need for the company. And then it's really close to a very busy stop sign, which, Going from the high school, you have to pass that stop sign. Everybody gets stuck there. And uh, it'd be a really good spot to put up a big old uh, marketing sign because people would like to take my sign. So they can't take that sign. I'm thinking, which one would be smarter going uh, multifamily with a partner or single family with uh, by myself running the company out of it? As far as long term, which one would which one should I do? Which one makes more money? Multifamily or the single family running the company? Well, I, I you know, you have to get into the, the bunch of the specifics there. Um, so I'll, I'll leave the specifics to you on that and just kind of zoom out to the, the framework level. You know, I invest in multifamily and my belief is that, you know, after, once I've bought the place, put in the rehab, you know, and, and, and then I just park it, right? So maybe I can add value when I, if I buy at a low price, maybe I can add value with my rehab um, to some degree, but at the end of the day, my philosophy on multifamily is not, I'm not getting rich through multifamily. Mm -hmm. I'm making my money through my job at bigger pockets, right? And my basic level of spend less, earn more um, at this and, and, and invest the difference. So really, I'm looking at multifamily as a place to park my money over the long term. I have a, I have a, a good property in a good location, and I sit on it for 10, 20, 30 years. So far, it's been eight, um, but that's the plan is to sit on it for, for 20, 30 years and, and repeat once every year, once every 18 months, once every two years or so with that. Um, so I anticipate something in the ballpark of 15 to 20% returns on multifamily once I have completed the initial buy and rehab, right? So there can be different returns if you get a good deal or whatever. That's great. Nope. I think that's a great, great move. To, and I do it personally. I think it's something that will build wealth over a long period of time. If you have another use for the, 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 the cash that's got, you think is going to turbocharge your business and is going to drive more returns, especially in the first couple of years, um, that probably speaks like it would be more advantageous than just parking your money in a multifamily property over the next couple of years. Again, I don't know how to answer with any more specifics because I don't have any more specifics in your situation, but that's how I so think the, about it. The multifamily would still be a house hack and it would be with, uh, with a partner. So he's the one that would bring the money down. So I would still be able to keep 
majority of my money, I wouldn't have to put the 3.5 to 5% down. I would just have to bring the deal, the hustle, and then live in it. So either way, I would still be able to, I don't know, I'm gonna have to go back and forth with it. But whatever, whatever you just said, what you just said, I have the notes on it, and I appreciate it. So thank you. Sounds like they're, you're either heads you win, tails you win. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. I think those are all great options. It's, it's good to have options and it's good to be, um, I think Adrian's 20 years old. I mean, it's like when awesome. I was 20, none of, none of this was even remotely in my mind, mindset. Um, great question, Adrian. Let's go to Daniel. You got another one? Yeah. Scott, how do you uh, approach lifestyle increase? <laughs> So the, the idea is to get on the other side of the financial independence equation here, right? Where your mm -hmm. assets generate more return than your lifestyle costs. So I, I got to that point three, four years ago. Um, and now, you know, after seven years of house hacking, I live in a nice apartment, right? It's 2,400 square feet. It's got, you know, two and a half bathrooms, so three toilets, um, which is the most, you know, I've ever had by two um, in, in, in that unit. So, um, it's, you know, I, I, I spend the money that I'm generating with my assets to some degree to cover an inflating lifestyle cost, right? That's not, you know, you, you always got to get, you got to be careful about that. But the idea is, is that once you get on the other side of that and your passive cash flow is more than your lifestyle expenses, you can start to spend more as that pile grows and that passive cash flow grow. So I will just stay in that situation forever. And then the fact that I earn a job or I earn money from my job is just gravy, right? That's just all piled up income on top of the, the passive income that I can continue to, to pile onto my asset base over there, right? So that, that's how I think about the, the lifestyle inflation. The point is to spend more money. So hopefully, you know, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, my net worth will continue to grow substantially and that will allow me to conservatively spend large amounts of money on my lifestyle if I so choose, or just reapply it to investments. Very cool. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, let's go to Aiden. I think you must have another question. Yes. Um, I have one question. It's, it's, um, so I am heavily considering doing house hacking in college. And I was wondering whether you think, because I have typically two schools in mind that I like to go to, but one school has a better business school, but is um, it, the, it's more expensive to house hack there, while one school has a worse business score. Like, it's not as good, but it's cheaper to house hack there. So I was wondering, which one do you think would be, uh, on your opinion, a better decision? Man, that's, that's interesting. Um... Better business school versus the other one you can house hack in. I think I think that's going to be an art question that you're going to have to kind of feel out there. I don't I don't know how you I don't know how you would would specifically. I mean, if it if it's just like is the business school much better, and am I going to get you know? So it, it, it all depends on what, where you want to be in ten years, right? If you want to right. be, you know. If you want to go and do like the best, go to the best investment bank and get the best job out of out of that business school, then you know that go the top business school will be the the better choice with that. If you're like I want to be phi in five years, um, and and you know probably the getting started in the real estate would be a better probability bet to to get going there. But I I don't know what the I think it'll just depend on your goals there. I see, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm sorry. I was, that was a least, uh, was a least helpful answer. I think I've given all day so far. No, so, no it's, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is, that is a tough question. I, I don't know how I would answer that. Um, all right, Adrian, Aiden, your hands are up, but I think that might be from your previous question. Um, I know there's gotta be some more people out there with questions though. Terry Turner, good to see you too, bud. Um, I haven't said that yet. Uh, what's your question? And by the way, Scott, you got to listen to Terry. He has a great radio voice. 
All right. Oh boy. Uh, my uh, camera's slipping in. Like, gotta find my mic here, but hopefully, Ugh. is it all sounding fine? Yeah. It's a, it's a little low volume wise. Oh, uh, how about now? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, my question's pretty simple, um, but I've just been. It's still a little low. Okay, let me. Let me no, 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 just, just your voice. Um, the, the tenor, it, it, you sound great. That was a terrible joke. I just he was making a joke, and it was <laughs> it was it was a definite teacher joke. Yeah. Okay. It's a... But now, now you're on mute, Terry. <laughs> Man, it's just uh, I'm all over the place right now, like a mess. But uh, my my cam my uh, computer doesn't have a webcam, so I'm using my phone. But then it like slips all over the place because I don't have like something to hold the phone. So it's just yeah, it's a mess. But anyways, back to my actual question. Um, in within the last year, um, because I know it's been a long time since you've been in getting into finance, but book wise, in the last year, what's been the best one you've read or that you would recommend to um, our age group? Hmm. It can even be an audiobook or maybe a particular podcast. It doesn't have to be just a book. But. I've been I've been really enjoying Freakonomics radio um, to to a good degree. I've been reading a lot of books on uh, how to be a good, you know future dad, because we're trying to start a family. So a uh, little different than probably what you're looking for. Um, I'm, I'm currently reading Alexander Hamilton, which is, I think, fascinating read um, by Cherno. I've, I've really loved his, bio his biographies. I'm trying to think through here. Um, oh, I really liked Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. That one really gave me a lot of good perspective there. Um, the Outsiders is probably one of my favorites of all time. So The Outsiders is, um, and this is not the, out, the popular one, this is The Outsiders, Eight Unconventional CEOs um, and Their Radically Rational Blueprint for Success. Um, really like that book. It talks about how, you know, a lot of CEOs are driven by building the biggest company. Um, and these guys were focused on IRR, which I think is is more aligned with, with my mindset there. What was that one called? It's called the Outsiders, Eight Outsiders. Unconventional CEOs. Cool. Um, yeah, I'd say Outliers, Freakonomics, and that book are probably the the three that I've read in the last year that have been uh, most interesting. Sweet, appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. What are you reading? Um, I just finished Dan's book, First Two Million, um, nice. and then I picked up. Uh, it's right here. One second. Anybody else have any good book recommendations? I'm, I'm uh, five gears. How to be five gears? and productive when there's never enough time. Uh, I gotta five gears. Back on so I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. A book called Five Gears. My mom gave it to me um, to check it out. So nice. Well, I'll I'll check that one out. You should uh, read. Uh, I think it's called Into the Wild. I haven't heard of that one. It's uh, It's about that guy named Chris McCandless who 1992 walked to Alaska um, after he was a really successful guy. He just wanted to like live life. So he hitchhiked all the way there. And just, it's interesting. Sorry. That's cool. topic. No, I think it's great. If, if anyone else has more books, I'd love, I'd love to just pop them in the chat here. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure a bunch of, I'm, I'm sure a couple of people have some good ones there, but. Yeah, if you haven't dropped them, I'll definitely steal some recommendations. Thanks. So the book, uh, Scott, you mentioned Outliers by Gladwell, um, not Outsiders, but Outliers by Gladwell. I loved that book. And in my mind, I always, whenever I think of the Sheik's Freaks community, I always think these are outliers. These are the, you know, well outside the bell curve of people who are hammering this success uh, grind um, at such an early age. I think all of the Sheik's Freaks members are outliers to a certain extent. <clears throat> uh, Ben Carver, back to you. Yeah, so um, Scott, um, so I'm about to be a senior in college and I'm going in for marketing. So this question's uh, of particular interest to me. Um, one of the, the four pillars of Bigger Pockets you said is content creation. I was wondering if you could speak to um, Bigger Pockets view on that, their processes, uh, where the focus is, any key things that you've learned as the, as the president of the company. Yeah. So from a content creation perspective, it, well, well, 
the, the, the strategy behind the content is investors before they buy their first property want to spend four or 500, maybe a thousand, let's call it 250 to 500 hours learning about real estate investing before they're going to make a large real estate investment purchase. So that education is that self-education is going to come in the form of listening to audio, watching videos, browsing social media, meeting people, reading books. Um, so you have all these different forms of content that people want to immerse themselves in. And, and, that, and that really is the idea is people want to completely immerse themselves in this world and tune out the Kardashians and all the other stuff that's going on in their feeds. So our strategy is, you know, let's be in all of those places and have a strong presence in all of those by leveraging our community and the, the user generated content that investors each and every day are coming up with new brilliant ways to tactically invest in house hacks in Denver, Colorado, like I shared earlier, right? So the genius is in the communities and finding those great new topics, not in me or anybody else um, who's an individually smart investor, right? It's, it's that aggregate power. So we, we have production factories that kind of churn that out across various different types of content formats. So for example, our YouTube channel, or let's use a podcast. That's, a, that's our best factory, I think, at this point. So we have the talent, right? The hosts of the show, like David Green and Henry Washington and Brandon Turner and Rob Abasolo and these other guys, right? And they host the show and we pay them per show um, to produce that. Then we also have an audio and video editing team. So that after the, the raw audio is taken, you know, the guests are booked, hosts conduct the interview, edi, uh, audio file is shipped out to, to the Philippines where it is edited by our contract team. Then it goes to Spain where it's where we have our audio or I'm sorry, our video editor doing the, doing the, uh, the cut for YouTube. Then it goes to, I think, New Jersey where we have a guy who does nothing but listen to the podcast at two times speed and give us titles um, for that show. Um, and so, because titles are such an important com uh, component of the, the production process. So we boil that down to about 250 bucks to produce a high quality podcast episode in terms of editing and production after the show, right? The hosts um, are, are a major expense and as is sometimes um, the, the process of booking guests and that kind of stuff. But then the editing is there. And then I call something, right? And then the rest of the team that oversees this process costs something. So we have an overhead allocation per show as well. So you're able to boil that down and say, okay, the show has to get a certain amount of downloads or listens or ratings, depending on what industry you're in, to justify that production cost, right? So let's say that we get 10,000 downloads, right? 10,000 downloads tr translates to about $1,000 in advertising revenue, right? E we have four ads and each ad usually charges $25 per thousand downloads, right? So we're able to get to this, you know, four times 25 is a hundred, a hundred dollars per thousand downloads is a hundred dollars per thousand downloads. You know, that's, that's a thousand dollars for 10,000 downloads, right? And that is kind of around where we think the break even point is, is if a, a podcast can get to 10,000 downloads per episode or more. Other, otherwise you're losing money on that, on that show. And you know, you don't get to remain in the CEO spot for a very long time if you uh, scale things that lose money. So the idea is to be profitable on a, un on a per unit basis in these programs and then scale production. Because if the ratings are there, that means that the consumer, potentially some of you guys, likes the content and wants to do that. And so that's the number one goal is, why do we do a podcast? To be listened to. But we have to also stabilize that with, you know, juxtapose that with the fact that we have to get to enough ratings on each individual piece of content in order to justify the cost to produce it, um, to scale it up. So each of our business lines has a factory similar to that, um, that we're building or in progress building. So YouTube content would be similar. Our book publishing business has a much longer cycle time um, than, you know, we can get a podcast out in a day or two, but the, the book publishing business takes about a year um, and we go from there. That makes total sense. Thank you. Absolutely. Great, great question, Ben. Um, hey, I have a bone to pick with all of you. None of you reminded me about the screenshot, but I just remembered. So before we get to Marcel's <laughs> question, 
Um, I'm gonna count three, two, one, and then we're all gonna smile, wave. You can take a screenshot picture, and then um, we'll all do our very best to share this uh, amazing meeting on social media, tagging Scott Trench, Bigger Pockets, all that good stuff. Um, I'm trying to find Scott on my screen here. I just lost him. Oh, there he is. Got it. All right. So let me get ready for my screenshot here. Do, do, do. All right. <clears throat> um, one, or sorry, three, two, one, and got it. All right. Uh, Marcel, what's your question? So I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into to um, this creating businesses thing. So let's say you're 20 years old and um, you're doing things on your own. Like, like for me, I have a wholesaling business and that's what I do right now. And I'm also a real estate agent here in South Carolina. Um, I wanted to ask you, how would you kind of go about building that business experience, right? To be able to go buy these businesses and turn them around. Well, right now you're building a business, right? Yes. So, you know, I, th I think, you know, by virtue of doing that, you're probably, you know, getting started on, you probably don't have any employees. Do you, do you have any employees? Uh, cold caller. Yeah. Okay. So you, you have, you have one employee, one, one, at least per person you manage to some degree. Yes. Great. So I, I think that's a great start. I think the two, the two, the three biggest things you can do are one, build up your capital, right? Because no one's going to care about your business experience if you can buy the business, right? And you're the highest bidder to, to some degree. They will care, to some, but and, and you should you should care about that. But having there's no substitute for having some liquidity um, and some capital to put into a potential acquisition. The second thing I'd be doing is I'd be reading and 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 learning as much as you possibly can. Invest that 500 to 1,000 hours. It's probably if it's 250 to 500 to get into real estate, it's probably 500 to 1,000 to get into this category. I'm making that up because I don't know, but I would, I would, I would guess that that would be where, where I'd be. And then the third part I think would be networking, right? Can you meet some of the, these business brokers and business owners and begin forming relationships and just share that that's your goal. You know, you might meet somebody who's 65 and has had their business for 30 years or 35 years and doesn't know who they're going to sell it to and isn't going to sell it in the next two or three years but they watch you building your business and doing what you're doing and know that that's your goal, you may find yourself getting approached in one, two, three, four years um, by these folks to be the, the potential buyer to some degree. So I think it's that education, capital, networking. Any specific books? Um, I think I think if you, you could start with the, the business classics like the E-Myth, um, uh, what is the Michael Gerber book that I'm blanking on right now? The Lean Startup, like the Lean Startup, the E Myth, um, just you know, crush those. I remember I, I read I read those. I read all of the sales books by like Bob Berg and like these other these other sales books um, out there, Zig Ziglar. Um, you know, just you know, start crushing, cruising through those different types of business books. Um, and do it in the context of building your business, right? Just by building your business and getting it to the next level, I think you will um, learn learn more about that. So, how's that helpful? Very. Thank you. Okay. All right, Scott. I, I got one question for you. Then I think we'll wrap up after that. For for the young members here, they already have some pretty seriously uh, focused mindsets. But what would be some advice you would give to a young person who is trying to develop the right mindset for entrepreneurship, for real estate investing, for early financial independence? I, I think I think it's this this willingness to or this relentlessness to optimize your time. Right. You, you should either be making the most of your time um, for, for most of you guys. You're probably you're I, I'd imagine you're single. Um, and, and, and just kind of get, getting started, at least not married, um, and getting started in, in your careers, don't have a lot of other things like all time should be spent, you know, figuring out how to move to the next spot, or it should be spent enjoying yourself 
and going on a trip or seeing friends or building relationships to some degree. So if you can say, how am I going to avoid wasting time? Um, I either, I'm either enjoying it or I'm using it to something productive. If you can be relentless about that and optimize around that, um, I think that'll be the, the right mentality for the next couple of years. Um, there's, a, there's a time and place to relax, but I think it's on the other side of the few hundred thousand dollars in, in private personal net worth and a few thousand dollars in passive cash flow when you're over that hump, um, because it'll be so much harder to, to get on the other side of that hump after you have settled into a family and you know, career in five, six, seven years. But I think that, that, that yeah, relentlessness would be the, the thing there. Do it all, read, network, set the goals, um, hustle, save, earn more, do the side hustles, do it all, or do something that you love with your free time with it. But don't, don't let the, those hours get slipped by with Netflix or YouTube or whatever. Mm. In the, in the evenings, in the mornings, and weekends. Good advice. Good advice. Um, hey, everyone, that was quick. That, that went by really fast. We're at the end of our time. Uh, it's 6.30 here in Denver where Scott and I are at. And so we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Scott, thanks so much for joining us again on the Sheik's Freaks community, our mastermind Sunday night group. Uh, very much appreciate it. Um, for I got, those who, I I think, got one more question in there, by the way. So, which is a funny one. The who's the most famous person I've met in the last year? <laughs> so, good question. We've got the the president of the Kansas City Fed. His name is Tom Honig. He was the only Fed chair, Federal Reserve <laughs> president who voted against all of the money printing we've done in the last ten years, quantitative easing ten years ago. That was the most interesting person. Although he's probably not that famous. Most famous is probably just the, the financial um, folks that we have all the time, like. Uh, JL Collins or Ramit Sethi um, that we've had on the show. Good. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to give Scott a, just some props here. He, um, I mean, he volunteers his time to be on this, on this meeting has done it a few times in the past, but he also comes into my classroom and talks to students, a couple of which who are on, on this call right now. Um, just an all around great guy. I mean, you can't meet a better guy who's, who also wants to give back, help people follow in his footsteps and achieve and grow and um, live their best life. So Scott, thanks again for being here. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, the rest of you, as we talked about at the top of the, sh uh, the show, I feel, like I'm a, I feel like I'm a podcast host now, like, like Scott. At the top of the meeting, um, it is time to re-engage and I'll see you here next week. We have a, a, a guest. I mentioned Will Brown will be here. Um, I'll tell you more about him in the community and through some emails, but this is the kind of group we should be having every week, 20 plus people. Um, there's, there's good stuff going on. So uh, if you have any questions, concerns, just contact me, um, DM me, email me, text me, whatever you want to do. And I hope to see you all next week. Until then, go out there and get your freak on. Scott, yeah. Yeah, one one parting thing here. One one of the reasons why I'm so interested in what Mr. You know Dan or Mr. Sheiks, depending on um, uh, your relationship to him, is uh, uh, why I'm so interested in this is because if you help people become financially free early in life, these are the people who are going to change society, right, and they have some sort of major impact on the world in some degree. I will not be able to predict it um, with this, but I know that if you guys achieve financial independence by 25, 26, 27, 30 that there's going to be some sort of impact you're going to have on your local community, on a nonprofit, um, in politics. Um, you're going to invent something. Something like that is going to happen um, if you help relentless people uh, not have to work for money anymore at an early age. So that's what inspires me and gets me going. And yeah, multiply that effect by all of you guys and as many thousands of people as you can impact. Um, I think that's that, that's good work. And it was just the unfair truth is that there's just more potential in young people if you can help them get to financial independence in their 20s or 30s <laughs> than they are in, in, in it, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So that's what gets me up in the morning and why I am so grateful for the opportunity to come and speak to you guys. So thank you for spending an hour with me tonight. All right. Yes, Scott, thanks so much. Um, it's actually why I do what I do as well here. So, uh, Awesome. We'll, we'll call that a wrap. Hope to see you all next week. And yeah, take care, everybody. Be safe out there. Bye. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Thank Dan. You. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, guys.
Thank you. And if you like this video and want to see more like it, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You should also go check out our website and Instagram, which are both linked below this video. Thanks again for watching. Now go and get your freak on.